Here we'll be taking an example and describing how cognitive work analysis can be applied to a real world setting and some of the benefits it has. The example we'll be using is that of helicopter mission planning. Here we're talking about planning missions for um, attack helicopters. This planning involves determining where the helicopter needs to go, via what route, and also what kind of munitions and what payload is required for the aircraft to complete its mission. Before the introduction of digital systems, this process used to take place on paper maps with pens, uh, pencils, notepads, and also kind of what's termed as Dalton computers, where effectively lookup tables for calculated things like fuel burn rate. The introduction of a digital system um, and digital mapping allows routes to be planned um, using some levels of automation, fuel burn rates to be calculated automatically, and adjustments made for things like payload. Once a route is planned, um, it can then be transferred onto a data transfer cartridge and then used to populate the display within the aircraft, um, transferring things like waypoints. So we'll be applying the cognitive work analysis framework at a few stages at a time. And initially we start with what's called work domain analysis. Work domain analysis lists the constraints within the domain independent of activity. So kicking off with what's termed the abstraction hierarchy, we start at the top and we ask ourselves the question, what's your overall domain purpose? In this case, the domain purpose or the overall reason for being of the system, and here we're talking much more about the domain rather than what's actually going on within the system. And the purpose of the domain is to plan missions to enact higher commands and temp. The next level down, we start thinking about the values that can be used to describe how well the system is achieving that domain purpose. In this case, we can start thinking about things like flexibility. And there's more than one here, but I'm just showing one for graphical purposes. At the next level down, we start thinking about the domain functions. And the domain functions, are, as the name suggests, are key to the domain. They're the functions that need to take place, and they're described in terms that are specifically related to the domain, in this case, helicopter mission planning. And in this case, it's things like payload required. It's very important that the correct payload is calculated um, for the mission. Next level down, we start thinking at a physical level and independent of the domain purpose. So now we're not thinking about helicopter mission planning, but now we're much more thinking about describing what physical objects in the system can do. And here we start thinking about developing an understanding of enemy targets and their capabilities. At the base we start to list the physical objects and the constraints that shape the way they can perform and some of the capabilities they offer. In this case things like orders or air tasking orders. What we do is we take all this information and plot it in a, a large diagram. It may seem a little overwhelming at first but hopefully I'll explain it, it will seem a little clearer. So what, the first thing we see is that there are many domain values, many domain functions, many physical functions and many physical objects. However, we're, at the top we have our single domain purpose. This is specific to this domain, other domains may have more, but in this case, the only reason the system exists is to plan missions to enact higher commands in temp. The values we use to evaluate this are things like mission completion, adherence to rules of engagement, self-preservation and minimising casualties. The top half of the diagram down to the point where it says domain functions is really talking about everything specific to helicopter mission planning. The base of the diagram starts to list the physical objects and what they can do, what they can afford, the physical functions, independently of this functional purpose or domain purpose, which is helicopter mission planning. So here we're talking about maps, and maps allow us to develop a terrain understanding, weather forecasts allow us to develop a wind understanding, and these physical functions can be applied to a whole host of other domains. So what we have is, as the title abstraction hierarchy suggests, is a description of the system at a number of levels of abstraction. And the lines between these um, describe these links and show how the, the, system, the model links together. So take an example of payload required in the centre. We can follow the links upwards and we can say 
Why am I interested in determining my payload required? Well, it's to ensure, to ensure flexibility. If we have too heavy a payload, we reduce our um, fuel burn rate, or increase our fuel burn rate, I mean, uh, meaning that we have less flexibility on where we can go. However, if we have um, too little payload in terms of munitions, we may not be able to protect ourselves, or we may not be able to complete our mission. So it's about establishing the correct type of payload and the correct volume. All of these things filter up to plan for the mission. Following down out of the, the link payload required, we can ask the question of how do I determine my payload required? Well, in this case, it's through having a weapons capability understanding. We need to understand what each weapon can do. We need to also understand where the enemy is, um, their disposition, their capabilities, and also where the friendly units are. We want to make sure that we're using the correct level of munition to neutralize the enemy without having an adverse effect on other friendly units. Following at the bottom, we see all of these physical objects can help us, things like maps, air tasking orders, um, and weapons performance information. Stepping forward, we can start to think about some of the other constraints in the system. And now we're focusing on the constraints imposed by specific situations, i.e. time and location. What we've done here is we see a diagram on the left-hand side, which is the full diagram, and on the right we see an enlargement. On the y-axis of this diagram, we see all of the domain functions taken from the abstraction hierarchy plotted up the y-axis. Along the x-axis we see a number of situations that are specified by both time and location. On the ground we're talking about before the air aircraft has left, planning in the planning cell which generally has a large group of people, digital computers. The ground on the aircraft is once the pilots have left the planning cell they're on the ground about to take off. A forward air refuelling point is again on the ground, but it's after the mission has started while the aircrew are, are refuelling and rearming. And in the air um, is while the aircraft is in transit between locations. The notation that's been adopted is a dotted box indicates the constraints where the only place where these, physical, these functions physically can take place. So looking at the bottom, calculation of minimum safe height, the only place this physically can take place uh, is in the planning cells on the ground. Tactics development, on the other hand, can take place everywhere. However, the box and whiskers indicates that typically, due to other constraints, it would only really take place on the ground, though in extreme circumstances it can be done elsewhere. Something like timing calculation can be done everywhere and typically is. Moving forward to the social organisation and cooperation analysis phase, we can start to describe the constraints that govern who can do what. So reusing the, the previous diagram, I'm now introducing a little bit of colour to code different actors. We can start to add extra constraints, and the constraints here aren't who should be doing activity or who does do activity, it's who can influence a specific function in a specific situation. The coding is green for KOX or fires, which is really the guys who are um, like the air traffic controllers who are determining and controlling the airspace. The blue are the aircrew. Orange are squadron MPS operators who are assisting the aircrew in developing their plans. Yellow are the command team and pink are the electronic warfare officers who offer specific advice about different weaponry. The first thing that may strike you from the diagram on the left hand side, the complete diagram, is that once the aircrew have left the planning cell on the ground, they have the sole responsibility for all of the functions. No one else can physically implement them with the sole exception of the timing calculations. This is predominantly a physical constraint of the fact that there's no data link between the aircraft and the control room. The other thing that may strike you as well is that on the ground, um, things like route planning, there's a lot of different colours on there indicating that a number of different actor groups can have an influence on the system. Well, this doesn't give us the answer about who should be doing what. What it tells us is who physically can 
and we can start thinking about allocation of function 